I wish to make an introduction to the latest member of our family. Who is going on the screen? Ah. Oh. So may I introduce you to, uh, introduce you to Rafa Leroué? Um, uh, uh, what's his name? Uh, Sam Hulibeck described him to me in a text as LRLR, Little Rafa Leroué. So when I'm, when I'm texting Sam from now, at, I just refer to LRLR, and we understand where we are. So um, you might wonder why um, an address on the temptations of Jesus, or if you want to call it an address, um, starts with a little puppy of three months old. So he, apologies to Rafa, but maybe he can now disappear from view. Uh, he's in the car and not very pleased, I don't think, at being left, but such is life when you're a puppy that's uh, quite mischievous and sometimes quite noisy. But uh, it, uh, we turn to uh, Luke chapter 4, and thank you, Claire, for reading it so clearly. Um, I don't know what you make of chapter 4, and for me it is an extraordinary passage. It is something sort of unique, it seems to me, in the life of Jesus. He must have explained to his disciples and maybe others of the events in the wilderness. If you can imagine that there was this point in Jesus' life, and I don't know how you look at Jesus as whether you think that right from day one almost, he knew he was the Son of God, he knew what he had to do, the mission was all laid out for him, and it was all sort of, all sort of there. Or whether you think that there was a growing realisation as he grew up. Do you remember in the temple, when the parents were looking for him, and he said, you know, did you not know that I would be in my father's house? Is there was something of the sort of, growing realisation of who he was, what the mission was. And it was, it seems to me, um, cemented together when he comes for his baptism, which is recorded by Luke just prior uh, to this in, in chapter 4. So in Luke chapter 3, it talks about the baptism. And it seems to me, and <clears throat> I'm not sure if I'm a heretic, but if you will bear with me and deal with me afterwards, if you think I am, but it seems to me that when Jesus was baptised, that was the moment that sealed everything. That was the confirmation um, where God says to him, it, it says in Luke chapter 3, as he was, right, when the people were being baptized, Jesus was baptized too. And as he was praying, heaven was opened. The Holy Spirit descended on him in bodily form like a dove, and a voice came from heaven, you are my son whom I love. And with you, I am well pleased. And it just seems to me that at that moment, that was it. That was the thing that really maybe set off Jesus into the trajectory that he always perhaps had grown into. And this was the moment. And then it says, um, Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, because we hear in, in Luke chapter 3 that the heaven was opened, the Holy Spirit descended on him. And so at the beginning of chapter 4, Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan River where he was baptized and led by the same Spirit into the desert where for 40 days he was tempted by the devil. He ate nothing through, during those days. At the end of them, he was hungry. And then the devil said to him. And we get these sort of three things. The devil said to him, then the devil led him. And then the devil led him again. It seems that Jesus was sort of like allowing himself to work through the, the complications, the, the battles of, of who he was and where he was going to go. And if I can take a little excursion out of this for a moment and ask you about your battles not that we would share, but that you would just for a moment ponder on the battles that you share with God about whatever, the things that may be your weaknesses, where you find the devil gets back at you. 
And if you get tempted, just remember and rejoice in the fact that the devil is tempting you because he wants you to fall. But he thinks you're worth tempting. He obviously sees in you something that's worth attacking. So it's a strange inverse, uh, you know, thing to, to recognize. But he's only tempting you because he realizes that you are of value. And I wonder how you work through the temptations. I'm going to give one or two little hints later on in, in the sense of looking at the pattern of G how Jesus handled it. But let's just move for a minute to the three temptations that um, are recorded. The one uh, about bread and stones. Um, if you go to some shops, I'm not going to say where, but you'll know that there's some of the bread that you find in some of the shops are really quite grotesque. Um, and um, I, I still quite hold, uh, I have to say, that uh, Marks and Spencer's sliced loaf at 76 or 79 is pretty good value compared to the stuff of the same price at the co-op, but we're not going to mention any names. <laughs> but bread and stones, what is this all about? And is there something about, if you take it a little stage further, is there something about... Jesus being tempted to use what he has, the abilities, the power, the enablement of God's Holy Spirit for himself. Use it for your benefit rather than share it with others and the cost that will come to you. Use it for you. And Jesus says, what does he say? It is written. Man shall not live on bread alone. Then temptation number two. So in his mind's eye, is it? Is it an imag imaginary trip or whatever? The devil leads him to a high place, shows him in an instant all the kingdoms of the world, and he said to him, I will give you all their authority and splendor, for it is being given to me. What a lie. For it has been given to me, and I can give it to anyone I want to. How the devil lies. Who ever gave anything to the devil? Have you heard the devil lie to you? Has the devil said to you, have you felt in your, in your life, I, have, I am a worthless person, I have no value? Two or three days ago, I spoke with a friend of mine who's going through an enormous um, battle in his life about who he is. And I, 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 sometimes I sort of take a little risk, you know. And I said to him, you know, you've got to start believing in yourself. And he said to me, I haven't been able to do that for a long time. I said, but you're of value. He said, that's difficult to see. And maybe you've been tempted to feel that you are of little value. Maybe the devil will take you to a place where you fell a long, long way. And he said, just remember that. Just remember that. As he turns the knife in the room. What's the devil saying to Jesus? How about a shortcut? Let's not go down the way of ministry that you see yourself going. The servanthood. Don't even think about the cross. There's a political route. It's a far better one. And you'll be, you'll be seen. You'll be, you know, up there in the front. You'll be there. You'll be a platform person. The shortcut, you could avoid the cross. Can you imagine how much that would sound an enticing moment? A moment. And Jesus said, it is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Don't serve the enticements. Don't serve the, the, the way that the world lives because the, world, the way the world lives does not work. And I thought to myself in the last few days about Ukraine and, and Russia and the way it's going. And you know how people say, why hasn't God stopped this? And you look at the Second World War and any other war that you want to look at and say, why didn't God stop them? 
And this may be just me, and please forgive me if you feel this is heretical again. Is this a, a huge visual aid whereby God says, I give you free choice in this world. But what you see in World War II, what you see in Ukraine, is what happens when people live without me. And this is the, how far it goes. And learn from it that you do not walk in those ways yourself. Has the world not lived, learnt anything? Has President Putin not learnt anything from Hitler and what happened to him? Has he not learnt from all the other people who have failed? Jesus says, it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve him alone. And then the final temptation, the devil took him to Jerusalem. I was reading a commentator about this, and, the, he, and he said, well, actually, it wasn't that far. And it might have been that Jesus actually did do a little, you know, field trip in, into Jerusalem, or maybe he's been familiar with Jerusalem, he'd been in many times, they went every year as a family. Maybe it just in his mind's eye, he saw Jerusalem in the and, and the devil took him, and it was so vivid. He took him to the highest place so that Jesus could look out. If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down. It is written, he will command his angels to guard you carefully. They will lift you in your hands that you will not strike your foot against a stone. If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down from this high place. We have to understand that the high place was a place of execution. The, the most common execution in those days was stoning. And so they would take the, exec, to the, the condemned person to the highest place and they would throw him down. And then the stone, if he had, not, if he had uh, survived the fall, because the idea was you got them to fall on their back, and break their back, and if they didn't, if they didn't um, get killed that way, then you threw the next stone so it would hit their heart. And if they did, if they survived that, then the barrage of stones to follow. He took Jesus to the place of execution, and he said, "Throw yourself down. You know the, the, you know you will uh, be rescued. Save yourself." Save yourself the execution. Save yourself the cross. Go another way. And Jesus answered, Do not put the Lord your God to the test. One extra little excursion now. Please note what Jesus says. It is written, it is written, it is written. And please note that as Jesus learnt scripture, he would command us to learn scripture as well. When I became a Christian, um, too many years uh, than I would like to remember, um, it, when I came in the prison this morning, yes, this is a li tiny little excursion. When I came in the pr uh, prison this morning, um, one of the guys in the gate lodge said to me, you know, I always like it when Henry comes because I realise I'm not the oldest person in the prison. <laughs> I got chairs, mate. And then he said, is it true that next year you will be, and he mentioned a number which I'm not going to, and he really brightened my day. <laughs> so it is, take the, let's go back again. It is written. Memorize, memorize, memorize. So when I became a Christian all those years ago, the thing I was taught was to learn scripture. And I was taught to remember those important promises and remember where they come from so that when you need them, you know where you can find them if you're a little bit hazy about what you forgot. Do you understand? Remember them, then see them in the context in which they're written and hold them. How many memory verses do you think that you know? Okay. How about the one, this is all about temptation, the one that says no temptation is common to man. Now, how many people know that one? I struggled with remembering where it came from. 
So I had a little ferret this morning, and it wasn't 2 Corinthians 10, it was 1 Corinthians 10. Would somebody like to look it up? No, we don't have Bibles in the pews anymore. We don't have pews, we have chairs. We have no Bibles in the chairs. Ah, But you have the Bible on your phone, haven't you? No. And because I can't remember it word for word, 1 Corinthians 10, what does it say, please? No temptation has seized you except what is common to man. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can stand up against it. Did you know that voice? That was one to hold on to. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Remember it, remember it. What about the other ones? The, all right, the nice ones. Come to me. And, ooh, very good. Right, where does that come from? Ooh. Shah Matthew 11. Okay, what about Jesus say, I am the way, the truth, and the life? Where does that come from? John, hey, chapter 14. Right, okay. What are those verses that are special to you? Taste and see that the Lord is good. New Testament or Old Testament? Oh, very good. What book of the Bible does it come from? Psalms. Quality. Right, okay. Remember those verses that you need that will come to you when you need them most. Okay? They have been my lifeline all through, all through. They have been my lifeline as I've held on. It is written, it is written, it is written. I always thought that those were like the three temptations of Jesus and that's the end of the thing. But I just want to finish with the other side of it. These three temptations that we've read are from the beginning of Jesus' ministry. It seems to me there were temptations at the end of Jesus' ministry. And Luke takes us into the Mount of Olives. And we find in the Mount of Olives Jesus praying like no prayer before. It says there was blood, it's what it, he sweated like blood, as it were. The stress of facing the cross. He had his disciples with him. He asked them to keep awake, to keep watch, to get the feeling that they were still around him because Jesus, fully human, fully, fully human, fully God, to have the company of those closest to him who fell asleep. And Jesus agonizes as he cries out, Father, if you are willing, if you are willing, if you are willing to spare me the cross, going back three years to the temptations, the shortcut, is there another way? And he came to the end of that prayer. He said, not only, Father, if you're willing, he said, but not my will, but yours be done. Jesus, in the power of the Holy Spirit, at the end of his ministry and as at the beginning, went back, went back, went back. It is written, it is written, it is written to be obedient to his Father's will. And when we walk with our temptations, as we do, most of the time, if not all of the time, we know what we should do. And we have this battle with what we want to do, or what we're enticed to do, and what we know we should do. And sometimes we lose the battle. Is that true? Is it true? Please, have you fallen as much as me? Okay? 
And what, do you, what have you done with your fall? Remember David. King David, so anointed by God, so used of God, so special. David it was, whose ruthlessness was ruthlessness, who became a murderer, who was a murderer, um, who, who, who was just an appalling man. And it was Nathan the prophet who laid David's life bare before him, as it were. And David cried out to God. Do you know when you walk closely with God, you've got that, not always, but often that sense of his presence with you. That sense that you're at peace with him and at peace with the world and it's a good place. And do you know in those times when you fall, you feel that no longer is that sense of peace anymore there. And you feel like God is a million miles away. And as they say, it's not God that moved, it was you. In those moments, David knew that he had failed more than anyone else. And what did David do? He, he wrote Psalm 51, his, his crying out to God. You know, I'm a failure, I'm, I'm, a, I'm just utterly rubbish. And he says in Psalm 51, take not your Holy Spirit from me. For in those moments, he has found that there is a nothing left and if we've ever walked with God, we know that we don't live with a nothing, we have a something. A something that's so real that it's beyond breathing, beyond description, but we know, we know, we know we belong to him. And when we give in to the tempter, we feel he is no longer there. And we may, might sometimes cry out to him, Lord, how do I come back to you? How can I find again the presence of your Holy Spirit with me, that I may know you again. And of course, he, he received us back as we turn from that which is wrong and turn to him. So when you are feeling, knowing the call of the tempter, the enticement of the tempter, and you know what God is asking, is your prayer still going to be the prayer before the cross that says, not my will, but yours be done. Could that be our prayer? Because it seems to me that's about the hardest prayer there is. Where in the face of the enticement, whatever it would be to you or to me, that we would say to our Father God, not my will, but yours be done. I was just want to finish off. I, it, during the last few days, I've been quite shocked. I had a text from a friend of mine in the UK. He's ex-army. And he, he started off, hello, Henry, I hope you're well. I knew from that that there was a conversation about to start. And so I said, yeah, fine, thanks. How's your week? Blah, blah, blah. And he said, I'm going to Ukraine. He said, I'm joining up with a number of ex-army personnel and we're going to Ukraine. And then he told me a little bit um, and uh, I was quite stupid. I said to him, so you, are they parachuting you in? And he, he was very patient with me. He said, no, there is no flying in Ukraine. All oh, right, okay. He said, we'll be, we will go to Poland and we will be driven in. That shocked me. This morning in the prison services, one of the officers, we, we talked about this and other things because we, the prison service was a sort of remember Ukraine, you know, obviously. And one of the officers, I, I recounted the story and the one the officer said, yes, he said, one of my friends is going as well. And that shocked me because it sort of brought it closer. And maybe as these two guys are enlisting in a, a group that are going to go to fight for that which they believe is important and fight for the country of Ukraine. Then maybe you and I need also to pick ourselves up 
when sometimes we languish in what we, you know, our sort of, oh, I'm not a very good person, well, I'm nobody really, and, and whatever, and I'm old, or I'm young, or I'm too young, or whatever, I'm not mature, or all that rubbish, and actually say, Lord, I want to enlist with you. And I want to stand up and fight for good things. I want to stand up and fight and say things that if they're wrong, I want to say that they're wrong. I want to, I don't want to be a person who compromises. I want to be a real Christian. I wonder whether you're ready to enlist in that. Or whether the tempter has spoken to you so many times that you feel that, you know, you've failed too many times. He's not looking at you anymore. You're worthless, maybe, you might say. Maybe you believe in the devil's lies far too much. Maybe he's saying, well, take a shortcut. It's okay. Avoid the cross. Avoid the pain. Use your Christianity for yourself. Have nice feelings and sing nice songs. Why did I show a picture of my, our puppy? Yeah, it's not my puppy, it's Arlene's puppy. Um, it's our puppy. Why did I show a picture? It's because this little chap has revolutionised, have you not, Esther, the last seven days at home. Everything seems to revolve around Rafa and what he can do, what he can't do, and what he shouldn't do, and stuff like that. And maybe there's a time when we might revolve our lives around God as well and allow him to revolutionise who we are, what we do, where we go, what we say, what we don't say anymore, how we live. Graham Kendrick, this is our God, the servant king. He calls us now to follow him, to bring our lives as a daily offering of worship to the servant kings.